Hi, I'm Kate Bowler, and this is Everything Happens. Hey, I'm back. Hello. I was gone all summer, and it was completely amazing. We toured around in our Airstream, visiting friends and family, and we lived in the woods for so long camping that at one point, somewhere around day 50, my kid looked up at me and said, Mom, we live in the woods now? I am so glad to be back with you all and having conversations about what you do when everything falls apart. How do you move forward? Like, what do you do with your life? I was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer three years ago. I've been in treatment ever since, and in the last year, I've been in a good, stable place where we are watching and waiting with scans. I'm so glad to be out of the sense of immediate crisis where it feels like I'm dangling over the edge of a cliff. And now, basically, it's like I got to take two steps back from the cliff and live there, build a home, eat some bagels, get casual. So that's where I am. And I need friends and strangers and community to figure out how to live beautifully now that I know that life is so fragile. So I wanted to kick off season two with one of my favorite go-tos for inspiration, but not rah-rah inspiration, like look into my soul and make me laugh inspiration. Today's guest is Emily McDowell. She is a writer, illustrator, speaker, and founder of Emily McDowell Studio, which makes my favorite greeting cards in the world. You'll see why. She also co-wrote a book with Dr. Kelsey Crow called There is no good card for this. What to say and do when life is scary, awful, and unfair to people you love. She calls her brand of encouragement, Whiskey for the Wounded. Perfect, right? Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Good Morning America, NPR, and is basically everywhere beautiful cards are sold. I'm thrilled to be getting into the amazing and terrible specifics about what to say and do when everything falls apart. Emily, I'm so glad to be talking with you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I feel like it needs to be acknowledged straight off the bat that we both went to the same hippie school. We were both lucky enough to attend a liberal arts school in St. Paul, Minnesota called McAllister College, where I'm assuming that we both fell asleep to the same sounds of the 2 a.m. drum circle. Oh, yes. Nightly. <laughs> That's right. And all of our clothing was hemp. And we, and we played alternate frisbee day after day. <laughs> it was, it's kind of a unique place to be formed. It was wonderful. I'm really grateful for having gone there. Well, I'm sorry to be starting with the terrible right off the bat, but when I was reading your work, I was really struck by the fact that you were only two years out of college when you got a diagnosis that no one expects, especially at 24. Would you mind telling me about what happened? Yeah. So um, I had been feeling kind of bad for Mm. a few years. And it was one of those things where I kept going to the doctor and they kept saying, we don't really know what's wrong with you. Mm. Some of your testing is inconclusive. Mm. And I ended up ultimately with like a Vicodin prescription and them saying, we'll come back if things get worse. Mm. (laughs) So, and I was, you know, 23 at the time, and I just moved to San Francisco, and it was like that dot-com boom, late 90s, where it was like David Bowie was playing at the (laughs) Pets.com launch party. (laughs) And so all I wanted to do was just like go out and party, and like, I was like, working is awesome, you know, like little did I know. So I didn't really slow down, like nothing much happened, except I just didn't feel good. And eventually what happened was I had some symptoms that turned into this strange rash that got me to the ER and that got me into the hospital. And then after two weeks of testing, they finally figured out that it was all due to the fact that I had this mass in my chest that turned out to be cancer. So you're suddenly a 24-year-old with stage three Hodgkin's lymphoma. I mean, just trying to figure out what those words mean, I imagine. Mm -hmm. And you write in your book that Cancer just kept showing up. That wasn't the last time that age just continued to present more challenges to you. No. So 
I was really fortunate. Um, I had a year of chemo and radiation and, and went into remission in 2001. And 10 years later, my college roommate, one of my closest friends from college, was diagnosed with cancer that came very quickly. It was very advanced when they found it. And she passed away about three months later. Did you immediately start using your art to process this? Or was this something that kind of came over time? No. Well, so what was really interesting is that after I was sick personally, the way that I responded to it and the way that my psyche decided to deal with it was to basically pretend that it didn't happen. Mm. I really wanted to put it behind me and not think about it and not identify as a cancer survivor. And I didn't want it to define me. And I really turned to a life that was essentially not informed by my illness at all. I think I'm the only person in history to have cancer and then go into advertising. Um, <laughs> but I... <laughs> <laughs> but this world may I not exist, but I'd like that to that create was, it. <laughs> that was the, exactly that that um, writing commercials was the best application of my talents. Um, and, uh, you know, I needed health insurance yeah. and I wanted to be creative. And I was afraid it was before the ACA and it was Affordable Care Act. Yep. Um, you know, you couldn't get basically you couldn't get an individual policy if you had a pre-existing condition. Mm-hmm. And so I went into advertising, A, because it was a way to be creative, um, and B, because it was a way to get healthcare. Mm. And so I had a 10 year career doing that. And, you know, cancer was not a part of my life and I wanted it that way. And when Amy got sick, that's my roommate from college. It was like a delayed reaction for me. Yeah. Somehow her getting sick was like a slap in the face to me. Like, okay, this is real. And it's not something that you can run away from and pretend didn't happen. So her being sick was really a catalyst for me to do a lot of different things. It was partially what actually inspired me to start the company that I now have Hmm. um, and to start making cards and to start writing and illustrating. And one of the things that I was really struck by during my own illness and then again during hers in a different way was that we don't know what to say and and sometimes there Mm. isn't anything good to say. Um, But people really go for some wacky places. (laughs) Oh my goodness, yes. (laughs) I'm trying to think of a a, a politically appropriate way to say this. People really reach for some wacky stuff. They do. And some really... And get well cards didn't help. I am thrilled to hear you say that. What comes to your mind when you think of that? Like some of the get well cards you may have read? Well, it's so weird to get a get well soon card if you might not. It's like a challenge. Like, oh, I'll I'll try. (laughs) Like, cool. Thanks. Or or I'm just thinking of this sheer volume of ones that said, like, I'm sorry for your loss. And then then my friends would just write in of like, of your colon. And they would just have to like add little things to it. Like with sympathy. (laughs) And you're like, am I dead already? Is this what it's like? Is this it? There's a funny thing where you're, they want to give you compassion, but like too much compassion and you're already being eulogized. Too little. And you're like, seriously? It was right. really bad, actually. Right. Because some of the cards are like, you know, you always wanted new boobs. They're like yeah. jokes about things like breast reconstruction or losing your hair or whatever. Like you get to wear cool wigs and it's like, yeah, yeah. no. You, know? <laughs> you don't get like, to bright side my trauma right away. <laughs> And wigs are expensive and like, no, like, fun. <laughs> yeah. Some of the worst things come out of people's mouths. Um, mm-hmm. I have some ones that come to mind, but I'm curious, what are some of the humdingers that people have said to you? Oh, my gosh. I remember this was back in the days of answering machines. Mm-hmm. And I remember coming home and it was a friend who I hadn't heard from in months a good friend and you know i press play on the answering machine and it's like hey i'm just calling because i've been thinking of you because a really good friend of our family just died of cancer so i'm just wondering how you're doing (laughs) (laughs) um and you're like cool great well still here (laughs) 
Um, <laughs> Still sentient. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. You know, the people like, I mean, I ran into somebody who I hadn't seen in a while and obviously I was going through treatment. You know, I was bald. I looked like hell, yeah. you know, and they were like, oh, you know, what's going on? And, and I and I just told them and they said, are you going to die? Uh <laughs> And I was like, well, eventually, I mean. <laughs> Like, oh, a spoiler alert. I don't want to skip to the end too like, fast here, but I am mortal. But, but you know, like, right. of this, I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. Jury's out. But, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Someone recently said, um, so is cancer going to be the thing that kills you? I was like, I don't know, but we, uh, <laughs> something or someone stay- might kill you in a minute if you keep asking questions like that. Yeah, oh. like stay tuned for season two. I don't freaking know, you know. Exactly. <laughs> That's so great. They're the people that reach for the worst acknowledgement of all, or they're the people who just say nothing. I mean, I have found that grief and loss can be so isolating. I've had good friends just like drop off the face of the earth the second they heard that I had terrible news. So, what stops people from reaching out? Like, why is it so hard? It's fear. You know, I had the same experience. Actually, the hardest thing for me about having cancer was the loneliness mm. because I had so many friends, especially because I was so young, just bail because they didn't know what to do. Mm. And it is the fear of being inadequate, is really what it comes down to is this fear that you are somehow going to make it worse, Mm. that you are going to essentially, you know, not be able to deliver to your expectations of what this kind of news brings up, you know? And I think we have a a lot of ideas about what's helpful that's actually not helpful. And it's easier than you think, like showing up and being there for someone is so much easier than you think. Mm. Because people think that they have to have some sort of sage advice or perspective or yeah. like offer some kind of wisdom that's going to make the person be like, oh, my God, you're so right. That's it. I never thought of it that way, yeah. you know, or that they have to solve it, that somehow their presence and their involvement means that it's going to be on them to like provide some kind of solution that they mm-hmm. don't feel equipped to provide. Mm. And really, you don't have to do any of that. Like, All you have to do is be present and be willing to witness, like bearing witness Mm. to your friend's suffering and just being there. And that's really all it is. It's so much simpler than we make it out to be. Mm. The kind of loss that you're asking people to witness is the loss of all kinds of different things. Loss of identity, loss of companionship, loss of community. Mm -hmm. Like the, the isolation goes so much more beyond just like fear for yourself, but like your partner leaves you and then suddenly you don't have any friends in common or you have a miscarriage and then you're always being invited to baby showers. Like we're losing bits of ourselves all the time and we need each other to sort of reflect back to us the person we were or could yet be. Does that sound right to you? That sounds absolutely right. And I think also to help us remember that we're still that person that we were before our diagnosis Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, Mm -hmm. you know, like to treat us like we are still the same person. Mm. Um, Because I think something else that happens is people start to treat you differently or people assume like you've lost your sense of humor or, you know, (laughs) like that you've that you've turned some corner where they can't relate to you anymore. And And in some ways that's true. But in other ways, you're still the same person. Yeah. Yeah. You still want to know the plot lines of Bachelor in Paradise. Or if you're me right now, you're watching every Hallmark Channel movie called Love, Christmas or Christmas at Pemberley Manor. <laughs> you still Christmas, want to- comma, love. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you want to talk about that with your friends. But you have this amazingly reassuring thing that you say to people. You say, if you want to learn to be kind to others, you have to be kind to yourself. What did you mean by that? That's something from one of Kelsey's workshops. This is my co-author. Um, she does these amazing empathy boot camps mm. where she goes into schools and workplaces and hospitals and kind of teaches people how to show up. 
Um, I think so much of what prevents us from reaching out is having these expectations for ourselves. Mm. And it's okay to not know what to say. And nobody expects you to know. Your friend doesn't expect you to know what to say. And in fact, saying, I don't even know what to say is fine. Yeah, totally. Um, in 2015, you started this special line of greeting cards called Empathy Cards that give people some totally amazing things to say to people like us. I was wondering if you could give me some of your favorites. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of our best sellers, and this one is particularly appropriate for this podcast, <laughs> says, please let me be the first to punch the next person who tells you everything happens for a reason. I'm so sorry you're going through this. That's so good. I love that one. I also love, um, I know there's no normal to go back to, but I'm here to help you build a new one. And then it just says, and I'll bring snacks. How how nice is that? I want snacks and acknowledgement. That's so good. Who doesn't? Good. Right. <laughs> There's also um, something we've talked about on the podcast before. It's something that uh, people do that I like to call death by free association, where people look at me <laughs> and then they're suddenly reminded that the world is awful. And now that they think of it, they have a third cousin who just died of leprosy and they'd very much like to tell mm -hmm. me about it. And mm -hmm, I love mm -hmm. the fact that you actually have a card for this. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yes, I do. It's actually, I think it's my favorite of all of them. That free association thing is so weird and it happens so often. <laughs> this card says, when life gives you lemons, I won't tell you a story about my cousin's friend who died of lemons. <laughs> was, <that's> so good. <laughs> was there a particular experience that inspired that particular card? There were just so many experiences of when people found out that I had cancer. Yeah. They would want to share with me a story about someone they knew who had cancer and had died. Okay. And it was like, you know, don't tell me. Why are you telling me that? <laughs> like, this is not helpful. I know you're thinking it, but why are like, you saying it? <laughs> and I understand, like, I have been in that place where you see the words coming out of your own mouth and you're like, ah, and you're just trying to pull them back in, you know, and I'm, and I'm sure that some of the people were totally oblivious and i think some of them were like oh god i probably shouldn't have said that <laughs> um you know because like actually hopeful stories that happen to someone you know yeah are helpful you know a story about someone you read about on the internet like eh, not as helpful no but a story about someone who died of the thing that you actively have <laughs> mm, you might want to skip it <laughs> I even found myself doing this the other day when I was trying to be encouraging. I was standing next to a friend and we were talking about how awesome her neighbor is. Her neighbor had this like really rough diagnosis and like has this colostomy bag and is still like making everything work. And for anyone who doesn't know, like a colostomy bag is sort of like much of the contents of what was going to be in your stomach are now on the outside of your body. And it's very awkward for a lot of people. Like it's kind of a private thing. And it, I was just like, I was so impressed that this person was like really doing such a good job, such a good dad. And at that moment he was like walking outside with his kid and walked past us and me just imagining myself to be complimentary yelled, wow, so you're really rocking a colostomy bag. <laughs> And then I was like, oh, dear, sweet Jesus, what is wrong with me? Like, this is a stranger. They don't want to talk about their bag with you. Oh, I was like, I was ready to die. So, yeah, I mean, free association, even in a complimentary way, it's like maybe not yeah. always a win. Well, it's because we also are programmed to want to relate. Mm. And like that relating is how we is how we connect. Yeah. Right. And so when someone says to you, I have cancer. Yeah you immediately are in your mental Rolodex, like, how can I relate? How can I relate? How can I relate? So that's where it comes from, I think, is this knee jerk, like, oh, um, cancer, I have something to contribute there. And Speaking of cancer. It's so like deep in our, like, mm -hmm. we don't even think about it. It's like our lizard brain is like, oh, relating. I, I can relate. <laughs> and I think a lot of the, a lot of the strategies that we use actually, when we're trying to figure out kind of what to say and what to do, mm -hmm. come from that place of, well, this works great in other areas of my life. Being able to solve a problem in another part of life means that you're like an effective person mm -hmm. who, you know, can probably hold down a job. Yeah. 
So your instinct is to be like, how can I solve this? How can I help? What can I do? What can I say? Like, how can I suggest another treatment? What if they didn't think of this? How can I be helpful? How can I be useful? You have this other category of card too, where like one of the other reactions is like minimizing, where like minimizers just want to help you get perspective because then you can get traction and get over it. You mm -hmm. are so good at framing this. I, I had an experience just recently. Last week I had a scan and I was hopping onto the MRI machine and the technician, it's always that awkward moment where they look at the, like their little clipboard and they see you have something terrible. And then she just said mm -hmm. like spontaneously, like, oh, but you're so young. And then of course she felt terrible. So she, as if to make herself feel better, immediately said, well, at least you're at such an amazing hospital. At least. Oh. At least. Yeah. So like, oh, no, at I, least. I love feeling like roadkill on a Thursday. No, and this was definitely my plan for my life. But you're you're such a big fan of asking people just to simmer down and to listen. And I love you have this one card. It says, I'm so sorry you're sick. I want you to know I will never try to sell you on some random treatment I read about on the Internet. <laughs> Is there a moment you can think of where someone really, like, instead of minimizing, just acknowledged your pain like this? Oh, absolutely. You know, my my best friend was amazing. There were so many people that were just fantastic. Mm -hmm. And really what it's all about is just saying, I'm here. Mm -hmm. You know, like, yeah, I love you and I'm here. And one of the things, you know, the, the thing really that I was trying to do with empathy cards and with like the card that you just read is to create something that would make people going through a terrible thing feel less alone and feel like, yes, someone gets it. Mm -hmm. My friends get it. My family gets it. They know what it's like to be me and to have all this stuff coming at me all the time. And it's like... They're sitting here in the hospital bed with me instead of sort yeah. of peering at me from across the room. Yeah. Yeah. And you really do believe that love is in all those little things. I what? do. I can think of like a thousand little things that made up the difference in my life. What are some of the little things that, that you hope that people might be able to learn to step in with love? It can be as simple as sending a text. Mm. I mean... We're talking about little, little things. One of the things that Kelsey does in her workshops, and we talk about this in the book, is a gesture wall where she has people write down the most meaningful things that were done for them in a time when they were going through something terrible. And she puts them all up on post-its on the wall. And the thing that is really striking about this exercise every time she does it is like, that it's really small things like nobody is like they paid for my college, you know, are they like <laughs> they let me move into their bedroom while I, you know, like while I recuperated or whatever. It's always really little things like they offered to pick up my kids from school once a week so that I could get to the doctor easier or they would bring me coffee from my favorite coffee shop every Monday morning yeah. or they would just check in. Someone sent me funny YouTube videos every day. Like they're really little things that yeah. don't take a lot of effort and that don't require knowledge or like, you know, a PhD in psychology or any kind of like, yeah. you know, sage Pinterest wisdom. Yeah. It was just like theme socks. You got theme socks. Like I have one. Exactly. That says you like can themes. do it. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Theme socks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just small and thoughtful. Yeah. I mean, I had friends, I have this friend who like dresses up these like two stuffed gorillas and just puts them in different situations and sends me a picture. <laughs> I could be going to amazing. I just like, I don't know how she came up with it. I'm totally sold on the concept. But I mean, I could be going through the scariest day and just little, little, little bits of love. I love people, you know, and I think that's where grace and faith and beauty really come in mm. like it's not in the it's not in the big stuff mm. it's in the little gestures of love that connect us and make me feel like we're all in this sort of shared human experience mm -hmm. yeah yeah I love that you just say like your kindness is your credential it's your ticket in is that what you meant by that mm -hmm. That's exactly what that means. Um, you don't need a PhD or a qualification or a 
or a course in how to talk to people who have cancer. You just need to be kind. Mm. Um, and you just need to care. Yeah. 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 Emily, it was so lovely talking with you today. Now, tell me where people can find you online. They can find us at emilymcdowell.com. And we also are available in about 1,600 retailers. And at the bottom of the website in the footer, there is a link to our retailers page where you can actually look up um, on a little map and see where you can find us. Perfect. We'll put that up on our website too. If I had to boil my conversation with Emily down to one takeaway, it's this. We all have exactly what it takes to show up in the midst of people's awful moments. Chances are, there are people right in front of us suffering in silence. Another miscarriage after years of infertility, the loss of a job, an empty nest, a divorce or bad breakup, a difficult diagnosis, it can feel impossible to know what to do or say. But they need exactly what we have to offer, ourselves. So if you're bouncing between reaching out or not, say something. Even something as simple as acknowledging the painful situation with, oh, what a year you've had, or gifting them some motivational socks. So consider this your permission slip to be kind. Not that you needed one. You seem nice. We all probably don't need perspective or explanations or the latest results from a quick Google search. We just need love. We need one another to reflect back to us that we are so loved. We are loved. And when other people show up, it feels like enough. My name is Julie and I'm from Edmonton, Alberta. People's nerves can make them say funny things and one of the funnier moments that I had was when I was talking to a friend and a woman that I did not know who was friends with the woman I was talking to, came to sort of join our circle. And I was in the middle of discussing a chemo treatment I was doing that week or whatever. As soon as she heard I had cancer, this woman who I'd never met launched into this very long, detailed story about someone who was doing some grad work in a morgue and went on to describe all about touching the dead bodies and what they looked like and what they felt like and it was just a very surreal moment for me because I I wasn't really sure how to interact with that person's story. And it was sort of maybe a role res- reversal because I was unsure in that moment what to say. The darkest day of my life was when my otherwise healthy 30-year-old brother became suddenly ill and rapidly deteriorated to the point of being placed on life support. And this was a time of a feeling lost and helpless, but I'll never forget the love of a family friend during that time. Our musician friend drove across the country, unbeknownst to us, and I encountered him in the family lounge, just uh, quietly strumming his guitar. He didn't bring any advice, he didn't bring any solutions, and all I remember him saying was, I'll be in here praying for you. It meant the world to us. Our daughter who came to be with us when our son died is a cancer survivor. When she was four, she had ALL. I was pregnant with her little sister, and I had more than one person say, well, if she dies, at least you'll have a new baby to console you, and you can have more children. Not helpful. My friend brought me a blanket to keep me warm as I slept in the ICU waiting room while my dad was on life support. I didn't ask her to do it, but she brought it. And she gave it to me as a gift after everything was over. That blanket was an incredible source of comfort in those times, and I still use it today.
Everything Happens is produced in association with North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. Support comes from Faith and Leadership, an online learning resource, the Issachar Fund, the Lilly Foundation, and Duke Divinity School. And so many thanks goes out to my amazing team, Beverly Abel, Amanda Height, and the Be the Change Revolutions team, and Jessica Ritchie. If you're enjoying these conversations, please go to Apple Podcasts and post a review, and come find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Kate C. Bowler. This is Everything Happens with me, Kate Bowler. <laughs>